Well, when I was a little boy sitting on my mama's knee. Hello, my name is Marcy Sklove. Welcome to Going Deeper. Today, my guest is Mehlika Samdani, founder and executive director of Critical Connections. Critical Connections provides analysis and opportunities for dialogue around critical issues related to the Muslim world and affecting all Americans. We will learn more about Critical Connections in this two-part interview. So welcome, Malika. Thank you so much for having me, Marcy. Thank you, thank you. Um, I like to start usually with this question. It's, it's interesting to me to know what in your early life uh, kind of informed the work that you do now, kind of got you on this path. Sure. So, uh, well, once again, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's such sure. a pleasure to be on your show. Um, well, you know, I grew up in Pakistan. I was born and raised in Lahore and spent most of my life there, my early mm -hmm. life there, except for about four years when um, my family sought asylum in England. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a very critical moment in my Roughly early what childhood. Age? I was about um, six or seven at the time. Okay. And um, there had been a military coup in Pakistan. Pakistan. And my father, who was a high court judge uh, in mm. the country, saw the constitution being abrogated by this military um, administrator who had come in. And he, like all the other judges in Pakistan, had been asked to um, take an oath to the new constitution. Or there wow. was no constitution, but to this new martial law administrator. And he refused. Mm -hmm. He was one of the very few judges who refused to take the oath. And because of that reason, um, his life was in danger. It wasn't, uh, you know, advised. He wasn't advised to sort of stay on in Pakistan. Yeah. And so our family moved to England. Yeah. And even though I was very young at that time, I think uh, I, as I grew older, I learned more about what had happened. But this sense of sort of standing up against tyranny mm -hmm. and injustice, I think really left an indelible mark on me growing up and mm -hmm. what it meant to um, sort of stand up for what you believed in, stand yeah. up for your principles. And so we were in England for about four years. And it was only after martial law had been lifted in Pakistan in mm -hmm. 1985 that we came back. So I think that really sort of, sort of, you know, um, influenced my way of thinking. Oh, sure. About standing up for what you believed. But then also, um, you know, I grew up in the mystical tradition. Okay. Uh, in Pakistan. Um, as a young child, like most of our summers were spent in the Savat Valley. Uh, which is now known for Malala Yousafzai and the Taliban, but it was a lovely idyllic setting where um, uh, this Sufi mystic, um, Baba Obedullah Khan Durrani, he had founded an ashram of sorts. It was a community. Yeah. He himself was actually an electrical engineer <laughs> who founded the you know engineering university in Peshawar, which is a town uh, close to Sabat. Um, but in the Sabat Valley, he had founded this sort of community where people would sort of retreat in the summers. Mm -hmm. And it was very close to nature. It was a lovely setting. And, um, and because he was from the mystical tradition, yeah. um, you know, there was a lot of, we saw saw in practice inclusion within that oh, wow. community. And yeah. I remember even as a young child seeing a lot of people from around the world come and visit him. Yeah. So people from England, from Germany, um, you know, men, women um, of all faith backgrounds, yeah. just trying to sort of understand his way of being right. and his sort of proximity and with the divine and how he practiced it. And so um, sort of grew up in this sort of multi-faith environment. Oh my gosh. And that really, I think, um, you know, even though we were young and couldn't really process all that we mm -hmm. were experiencing, really sort of um, led me to, I think, where I am in terms of my work um, mm -hmm. and sort of sort of bridging different um, faith communities, even though it's, uh, this is somewhat of a secular organization. We don't yeah. promote religion, but we do talk about religion oh, sure. as a way of bringing people together. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I didn't know that about the Sufi part. Yes. That's really interesting. Can you just quickly explain what Sufism is in, in regards to Islam? 
Well, you know, people often think of Sufism as something being very distinct from Islam, uh -huh. even though it's really the mystical aspect of okay. Islam. Sure. And it really is about, you know, there are different pathways to God. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate objective is to find proximity with God. Mm -hmm. And one way of doing that is to see the connection and the interconnectedness of all humanity. Yeah. And one way of sort of achieving proximity to the divine or whoever that larger being that you believe in right. is by serving humanity, is yeah. by serving his people. Beautiful. And so um, that is what we saw in his um, he didn't teach so much, mm -hmm. and he didn't consider himself a Sufi or a mystic at all, but other people were drawn to that oh. message that he practiced and which and his whole life embodied charity and wow. sacrifice. And yeah. so that's what it was. Okay, very good. So now, can you just give us a, a sort of an overview of Critical Connections? <laughs> Sure, so Critical Connections is a fairly new organization. Yeah. Um, it was founded about four years ago. Um, I live in Long Meadow, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and so that's where it's based. And um, what we do primarily is sort of, you know, put together events where people have an opportunity to engage in issues related mm -hmm. to the Muslim world um, that affect all Americans. And so, you know, when I moved to Western Massachusetts, um, I felt that there was perhaps um, not a space where people could discuss some of these very contentious issues sure. that they hear about on the news. And there's not a lot of space for nuanced dialogue around mm -hmm. them. And so um, what our events do primarily is we bring in experts. So whether it's an issue on radicalization mm -hmm. or militancy or geopolitics in the Muslim world or US foreign policy there, um, people are also very interested in gender dynamics within the Islamic tradition, oh, yeah. notions of sure. jihad and Sharia. So we put together events on all of these issues, always have experts sort of come in and give a more nuanced perspective, mm -hmm. you know, something that they will not hear from mainstream news outlets. Right. Right. Um, but they, it really, our events try and serve two purposes. One is to sort of um, uh, produce more information and give mm -hmm. people access to more in-depth perspectives on these issues, but also as a way to bring different communities together. Sure. where people can engage with each other in dialogue. Um, I'm sure you've heard that there's so many surveys done where six in 10 Americans feel that they've never met a Muslim. Right. And um, and we feel that that's, you know, uh, you know, a lot of Americans have perhaps met a Muslim, they just don't realize they're sure. talking to a Muslim, <laughs> either through their doctors or, exactly. you know, convenience stores or taxi drivers or engineers, you know, we're everywhere, right. <laughs> pretty much. But and I, think, I think it's easier for people to identify women who wear the hijab as mm. being Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so you don't see too many of them around. Right. And so I'm sure if I walk down the street, people would not recognize me as a Muslim right. and might mistake me from, for an Indian, a Hindu, exactly. a Sikh. So, um, so anyway, so our events are also ways to bring people together to sort of, once they hear the experts speak on the issue, then we create a space where people, people can engage with each other, Muslim, non-Muslims, mm -hmm. around some of these very contentious issues yeah. um, and sort of go in deeper with them. Yeah, that's that's really great. I I love the story of um, when you were working in D.C. and what sort of prompted you also to understand how ignorant a lot of Americans were. <laughs> well, yes, it was. Um, uh, it was actually in New York. Oh, I was, New York, not D.C. <laughs> yes, well, I worked, I also worked as a consultant with a think tank in D.C. But yeah. this was in New York. It was right after graduate school. Yeah. And this was in um, the year 2005. Mm -hmm. And so 9-11 had, uh, had taken place about four years earlier. And I was working at a think tank, um, a very prestigious think tank, a lovely place to work for, mm -hmm. you know, for a young college grad and um, university student. And um, it was a place where, you know, they used to, it was a think tank where they had meetings and events, um, somewhat similar, of course, on a much larger scale, somewhat similar to what Critical Connections sure. does. Um, and so uh, I had been working there and uh, they had a very strict dress code because mm. world leaders would walk through those doors and so the meetings were always very formal and they had a very strict dress code for the staff working there so for yeah. both men and women you know very um, dark uh, sort of business 
suit uh, where, right. where it was part of the dress code. And when I started working there, you know, I had just sort of come in from Pakistan three years earlier, and I was very comfortable wearing my traditional sure. dress, which is a kameez shalwar. Sure. And my mom had just sent me these beautiful kameez shalwars that, of oh. course, I wanted to show off. And so I asked the administration <laughs> there, I said, is it okay if I don't dress up in a suit and if I wear my kameez shalwar to work every day? And, um, you know, they were just so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And they said, absolutely, whatever you're comfortable with. And so that's how I would dress to work every day. Yeah. And then one day as I was walking into a meeting with very high level policy executives, uh, one gentleman um, who was a member of the council and who was sort of you know participating in that meeting came up to me and said, why are you always dressed like a terrorist? Yeah. And so that, I mean, I was taken aback immediately. Oh, the, sure. <laughs> the first thought that came to my mind was, you know, terrorists don't dress so elegantly. <laughs> but I mean, beyond that, I remember just really at that point laughing because I thought it was so preposterous what right. he said. And I sort of moved on and just, um, you know, went into the meeting and just thought, completely ignored that remark. Um, other people had witnessed it mm -hmm. and they reported it to the president of the council who then called me in later and was extremely supportive, very apologetic and mm -hmm. said, you know, we can revoke that member's membership. Yeah. And it's a very difficult uh, process trying to get into the council. Um, but, um, and I said, no, no, not at all. It's not a, you know, it's not a big deal. It's fine, it didn't affect me too deeply, but in fact it had. Sure. And even though I had brushed it aside at that time, um, you know, as time went on, it really sort of stayed with me and I felt that if this is somebody who's very well exposed, who's mm -hmm. traveled the world, and if those are the kinds of things that they're thinking here yeah. in Manhattan, you know, what would the is the rest of America thinking. Right. And you know, we lived in a very sort of cocoon, sort of a bubble like space there at the council. But when I moved to Western Massachusetts um, uh, a, a year later, I really felt like something more needed to be done. Um, and there were less few, far fewer opportunities here yeah. in the suburbs than there are in New York or Boston or oh, DC sure. for these kinds of events to take place where people are learning more about each other's cultures right. and traditions and politics. Right. So there are basically two arms of the organization. Uh, one in this transforming the moment. One is the protecting civil rights yes. issues and promoting civil civic engagement. Yes. And the other is bridging our divides, That's which right. I love. Um, and it's great that they aren't mutually exclusive by any means, right. but to focus on one or the other. And I first actually heard about you at the Sudaseti yes. um, event that you did with her. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just trying to imagine like this notion of bringing, you know, bringing people together, crossing our divides, when really angry, you know, you've had some run-ins with white supremacists, and uh, I, I just want to ask, how do you how do you manage, how do you handle that? Like that one example that sure. you had told me. Right. Well, you know, most of our, the events that we do is um, with our partner, Karuna Center for Peace Building, sure. which is an international peace building organization based right here in Amherst. Mm -hmm. And so we come up with these series together, you know, in terms of thinking about, you know, what's relevant to this current moment. And um, so we've been doing this for the past four years. The one, the series that you've just referred to is something that we started in January, in okay. the wake of the election. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was feeling so apprehensive about in the current environment and we felt there were so many vulnerable communities feeling mm -hmm. very targeted at this exactly. point. So how do we sort of take all of this negativity but also feeling at the same time that there was a lot of sort of positive mobilization mm -hmm. going on uh, and especially here you know in the valley where you know it, towns like Amherst and Northampton, where there's so many wonderful people, so well-meaning, I mean, amazing activists, mm -hmm. really trying to stand in solidarity. So how do we sort of, you know, use all of this wonderful energy to one, inform um, this activism, um, but then also see what the transformative role of a concerned citizen can be. So that's what brought about this Transforming This Moment series. Yeah. And so we had these two tracks. Um, and, and, you know, so part of it was, well, you know, uh, again, like, 
like you said, mentioned, there was the Civil Rights and Liberties track, and then there's also the uh, Bridging Our Divides track. Mm -hmm. And our last event, as you mentioned, was with a former white supremacist, right. uh, Mr. Christian Picciolini, who was a member of the first neo-Nazi gang yeah. in, in the US, um, in Chicago, Chicago, when he was growing up. And he spoke very movingly uh, about his own experience, his own journey of transformation. Um, and so that was a wonderful conversation. It was very inspiring to a lot of people. Um, uh, but, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, there's some very angry people out there yeah. as well. Yeah. And um, last year we had an event um, in Long Meadow, um, and it was on a religious intolerance um, mm -hmm. in the U.S. And we um, had invited a, a couple of wonderful speakers. One is Professor Peter Gottschalk, who's a professor of religion, and he's written this lovely groundbreaking book called American Heretics. And it sort of discusses the history of religious intolerance okay. of Jews and Catholics and just different faith traditions yeah. and how now the focus is on the American Muslim community. Right. So anyway, we had... Um, this was in May of last year, and we had advertised the event in a local newspaper. Um, yet this was going to happen at a local church in Longmeadow. And, um, you know, we advertised it and completely forgot about you know, sort of publicizing it in the local newspaper was on Mass Live. And just a couple of days before the event, I got a, a call from one of our speakers and she said, well, have you looked at the comment section below the article? Uh, and I thought, no, of course, I, I never pay attention to the comment section. Well, she said, well, you know, you might want to take a look. Yeah. And so I went back and I looked and of course, I mean, there were dozens and dozens of comments, but you know how the comment section is. And there was a lot of, you know, just very derogatory things said about Islam and Muslims mm -hmm. and, and all of those things. But what was interesting about this section was that some of the people who had written their comments had said that, well, we're not just going to post our comments here. We're actually going to show up at the event. And so um, so the speaker who had uh, written to me, you know, she felt very um, sort of apprehensive about what might happen and, yeah. and all of that. So we did let local law enforcement know. Oh, and we right. have very good relations with local law enforcement, um, both at the local level and also at the federal level. And mm. so we just let them know that this is what the, you know, the nature of this comments is. And, you know, um, but anyway, we were, I wasn't too concerned. But anyway, so the day of the event happens and our speakers had spoken. And, um, you know, when we have our small group discussions sure. uh, between the audience, um, it soon became very clear that those people, two or three of those people had actually shown up yeah. and were being very vocal in terms of how they felt about Islam and Muslims and, you know, said, um, well, uh, you know, they don't, Muslims don't believe, uh, don't belong on U.S. soil and they all believe in terrorism. And so, you know, all of those things. Um, and I could tell because the people who were sort of part of that discussion were quite shell-shocked as they listened to this oh, one yeah. particular gentleman. And but it was it, it was a very interesting moment because I mean uh, he was being very loud and very vocal and but at that moment I mean we felt it was very important as the organizers right. to let him know that this is a safe space right and that he might be a minority in terms of his views here but that his views are here to be for all of us to hear mm -hmm. and that we want to hear his voice uh, concerns. We want to hear his fears. And so um, I remember Olivia and I, Olivia, who's a director of Karina Center, mm -hmm. and I, we went up to that gentleman and said, you know, you're very welcome here. Thank you for being here. We know it's not easy being part of a group. You know, that does yeah. not necessarily agree with everything that you're saying, but we really want you to know that you will have an opportunity to speak. And yeah. uh, but we also want to hear from everybody else. And um, in that moment, Marcy, I feel like something shifted. Sure. Something shifted in that gentleman's eyes because he had expected either to be, you know, asked to leave or tone it down a little or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But I mean, something shifted. And by the time, you know, we were, uh, we had the small group discussions and we had a large group discussion, everybody engaged with him. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was so proud and amazed and moved by our audience members who were just so, um, nobody was adversarial. Nobody was contemptuous. Everybody engaged with him in a very sort of compassionate way, and um, and he got to say what he what was yeah. on his mind. Yeah. And at the end of the two hours, you know, he was exchanging business cards with people. Yeah. He had been invited to the local mosque. He is now the Pakistani Muslim businessman that he had been sitting next to has actually been with him to another interfaith event. Wow. And so they've remained in touch. And so it. It, that moment for me was just amazing. Yeah. Um, and it also taught me something. It, you know, 
that if you have a lot of hate or hostility mm -hmm. um, in your heart, the best way to engage with such a person is not by throwing facts at them yeah. or being um, or treating them with contempt. Right. You know, it's really to make that personal human connection. Right. And that is what provides that space where then you can engage in a deeper sure. conversation sometime you know, down the road. But at that point, it's that human connection for right. them to see you as a human is most important. And of course, I'm, you know, I always struggle with that. It's not, it's easier oh, said gosh. than done. Oh, totally. <laughs> but it's something, but it was, it was a learning moment. I think it was an educational moment for all of us. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that moment of the shift because, um, I didn't get to go to the next event with the ex-neo-Nazi. Yes. Um, but I watched, I, I watched the live stream. I was ah. very grateful for that. And he spoke about that as well. Absolutely. He spoke about how important it is to really listen and be present in the midst of what you want to do is the opposite. You want to right. walk away and sure. never see that person again. Sure. And the other point that he made that is relevant in this story is about how all of the different hate groups, be it white supremacists, Muslim terrorists, you know, inner city gangs, that they're all pretty much the same. Absolutely. And that they all, these are, you know, people looking for connection. Absolutely. And they sort of pick up the content of whatever the group is, you know, thinking and speaking sure. about afterwards. That sure. was his experience. Absolutely, that is and so critically important. And yeah. um, and I think that's what um, Mr. Christian Picciolini mentioned, yes. the former um, neo-Nazi. He did mention that you know if you give compassion to mm -hmm. the people who least deserve it when they least expect it, yeah. that can be life changing. And that's the bridge. And that is the bridge. Yeah. And that and that was his own experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Christian's own experience of then meeting with people who he had been taught to hate, right. whether they were African Americans or Jews, and then, you know, and then actually having an experience with them, meeting them one on one as customers, because mm -hmm. he had his sort of, you know, music shop and they would come to him. And, and that is when he was, he saw the dissonance sure. in what he was taught and what he was experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. And that is what causes that bridge. And you're absolutely right. I feel like it's, whether it's, um, you know, uh, terrorist organizations, mm -hmm. Muslim terrorist organizations, whether it's ISIS or, um, you know, neo-Nazi groups, or even the playground bully. That's right. It's, they are operating from a sense of fear, from yeah. insecurity, from yeah. a lack of compassion, a lack of connection. Right. And Christian spoke so eloquently about this. I think, and he said, it's never about ideology. It's, right. it's about three things. And I think he said, identity, mm -hmm. community, and purpose. Yes, having a purpose in having life. Having a purpose in life, having a strong sense of who you are, right. and having a, um, a community that you're a part of, right. that you're proud to be a part of, that gives you that meaning. Um, and, I, and, I, and I say that to my children as well, you know, mm -hmm. when you encounter a bully, well, one always sort of stand up to them, but also, also, also understand that it's not about you. Yeah, it's really about them. Right, this, that they are suffering. There's mm -hmm. something happening inside. They're the ones who need empathy. And yes, you know, you have parents who will take care of you, and you have a school that will take care of you. Mm -hmm. But just know that that person is suffering, and this is a manifestation yeah. Yeah. Um, of that. And you know, often we whether it's our home, the playground, or geopolitics, mm -hmm. whether it's ISIS or the Taliban or whoever, we sort of look at the symptoms, yeah. never the underlying right. causes right. Of, the com of the conflict, and really tend to sort of focus on the superficial ideology, exactly. whether it's uh, religious or it's political or it's something else, but not the underlying causes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. I. Uh... I can think of so many different examples. I mean, in some ironic way, Christian's story of how he got sucked into this neo-Nazi right. group was also because of a bridge. Absolutely. That the, this, you know, he was 14 years old, smoking a joint in the alleyway. Absolutely. And this uh, white supremacist comes up to him and says some very ugly things to him and uh, about other people, not right. about him. Right. 
And it wasn't, it wasn't anything that was said. It was that he was paying attention to him. He was noticing him. Absolutely. So it's, it's like that bridge, that's the wrong bridge. You that's know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get people on the right bridge, not I the wrong know. bridge. I know. And the scary thing now is the internet, right? So oh, social yeah. media and you know uh, groups like ISIS, I mean, uh, back in Christian's time, there was no internet, sure. there was no sort of that easy access. So it was somebody, this white supremacist who lived across the street from right. him. And so it happened to be like a, you know, a geographic proximity that mm -hmm. got them together. And now with groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda and others, um, even some of the, you know, sort of uh, white supremacist groups that operate right now, it's really the sure. internet that's radicalizing them. Yes. It's really uh, not the internet, but I mean, they're using sort of the internet as an access yeah. to sort of, you know, through online recruitment mm -hmm. and always sort of, um, and, and they're all predators really sort of, you know, That's right. uh, exploiting disaffection, That's right. alienation, lack of identity. Yeah, and those are qualities that we all are suffering from on some level. Absolutely. The dislocation, the sense of, of not being connected. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, we are going to continue um, in part two, and I think that this is a good place to stop, and we'll get started again in part two. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time in part two.